I was just punching this Care Bear in the face because I've decided if WWE doesn't want to have fun anymore when it comes to their wrestling product, neither do I. So I took a very, well, he's not very happy, but I took a symbol of love and I'm kicking his ass. But don't worry about that. In fact, it was quite weird. My name is Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. And I should be buzzing right now. I should be flying around the room like some kind of excited tamale because it's the Raw after WrestleMania. And sometimes the Raw after WrestleMania is actually better than WrestleMania. And WrestleMania 37, I thought was quite entertaining. So I was like, oh man, I bet they got a bunch of great ideas. Well, that wasn't entirely the case. But anyway, we take this, the finger of power, and we go through the show and we give the good bits an up. And be warned, we give the bad bits a down. Let's go. People were clapping Bobby Lashley when he arrived at Raw. I didn't really understand what this was. I thought he was meant to be a bad guy, but he was loving all of it and he started to sign some autographs. Also, nobody wants autographs in 2021. Everyone wants a selfie. Anywho, this was done so that Riddle could turn up and be like, oh, Bobby Lashley, I really will have a match with you. And even though Bob was like, no, not in a million years, you lost at WrestleMania. Why would we clash? Riddle was so annoying here to tie into his gimmick. Eventually, Bob was like, you know what? Fine, I will, just so I can tear you apart. I think Riddle wanted a title match too, but he didn't get that. But he did get a non-title one because, yeah, the second first thing we saw on Raw was Bobby Lashley, our WWE champion, going against Riddle, who lost his championship 24, 48 hours previous. Now, I'm not sure what I expected from the Raw after WrestleMania, but if I was going to get the loser of a match, I certainly did expect the winners. So at this juncture, I would just let you know, there was no Sheamus, our brand new US champion. There was no AJ Styles and Omos, our brand new Raw tag team champions. And that one especially made me sad. I will be honest with you, I sat through three hours going, well, I'm sure Omos will be next. I'm just sat here waiting for Omos. I don't know why I like him so much, but I do. How can they not get on Raw, which goes on for 79 years? Down. I also didn't expect a new commentary team, but I got it. Our new play-by-play -play guy is Adnan Vink, and Corey Graves is now back on Raw, and Byron Saxton is still there. And I've seen a bunch of people going, Vink was rubbish, I can't stand it. Would you give the man a break? It's his first night on the job, and it's quite a high-pressured situation. Give him some time for flubbing sake. Back in the ring though, man, who did Riddle upset? Because this went around about 10 minutes, but he barely got any offense in. It was just Bobby Lashley beating him and whooping him and throwing him around. Like if he had just torn all of Riddle's limbs off and then eaten them, I would have gone, yeah, that makes perfect sense because I've kind of seen everything else. I'm sure Riddle had a few flurries, but otherwise this was a massacre. And when he went for the floating bro and completely missed, Bobby Lashley locked in the hurt lock and we know how strong that maneuver is now. There ain't no way he was getting out of it. He didn't. Bobby Lashley murders a dude on Raw. But here's the thing, good. Bobby is meant to be a killer right now, and Riddle is being portrayed as a joke. So if they do get in the squared circle, I expect Lashley to run through him like he's a knife through bar. If our job is to make him unstoppable, this was a great way to go about it. So I'm giving it an up, even if 10 minutes is way too long to do a squash match. Rhea Ripley interview followed this, and very sadly, WWE wasn't that inspired by all the improv interviews we had to do at the start of WrestleMania part one. Because honestly, I could smell the script here. Why are we telling Rhea Ripley what to say? This was doubly true as well when she said this was the start of the brutal new order. And I was like, you can't call anything the brutal new order. Because everyone starts thinking about the NWO, even though it's slightly different. And then when you think of the NWO and you put a B in front of it, people think about the BWO. And that's just a whole different pathway. Anyway, she is going to fight Oscar later. We'll talk about it. That's not to say this was bad either. Like it was fine. It was just so WWE. And then talk about mixed emotions. Sheesh. I mean, this was like being cheated on by your girlfriend, but then winning a holiday to go away to some romantic place for two. Because the good news, we'll start there, make us feel all warm and fuzzy in our tum tum, was that the Viking Raiders were back and I was very pleased to see him. They just arrived with absolutely no explanation, but they are a great tag team, and the people they were facing here didn't stand a chance because they just ran through and they hit the Viking experience. One, two, three, so they can have it up. The problem, though, is that said opponents were Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin. Now, one, 
they didn't even get an entrance, and two, they lost here in can't have been more than five minutes. I mean, they barely did anything here, which makes you just want to go inside your own head and rip your brain out, because WWE essentially went, well, we'll take them out of the Hurt Business and allow them to slip down the card. Why would you do that when you have a group that everybody loves? So this shall come as no surprise, down. Oscar promo next, she was responding to Rhea Ripley and let her know you may have won that championship at WrestleMania, but later on, I will win it back. Remember when Shane McMahon came out onto WWE and said, we're not going to do automatic rematches anymore. What a pot of crap. Charlotte Flair was then out next. I could hear the rage. Come on. She stormed to the ring looking mighty pissed off and even demanded the camera operator held the ropes open for her. And of course, she feels slighted because she wasn't on WrestleMania. Doesn't matter that she's been on the last five, she is Charlotte Flair and she should be on every single one till the end of time. And then just started blaming her own failures on other people. So it's Lacey Evans' fault, it's Ric Flair's fault, it's Oscar's fault. Why does nobody understand when she's the queen and where the hell is her crowd? Even Rhea Ripley got it because Charlotte feels like everybody ignored her challenge and we just gave it to this NXT rookie instead. I was like, that's not what happened. Charlotte, you went up to Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke, yelled at them, and then just vanished. She said that Karma is a bitch and that she's that bitch. And because she said bitch twice in a promo, it means she's super duper serious. We've talked about this before. And then basically went through the entire women's division and insulted every single person. And now, yes, look, this was very similar to other Charlotte Flair promos we've seen before. But here is my take on it. One, finally, we know she is meant to be a bad guy because there was a huge period there where we had a game show that was called Is Charlotte Flair a heel or face? It was impossible to work out. But also, two, she took all the mad annoyance from the internet and she spun it here and she threw it back onto them. I just thought that was quite relevant. Also, she's always going to be figured in somehow. So if you are going to do it, I'd rather have this character because the other version doesn't make any sense. Blow up. However, talking about figuring her in, it certainly shouldn't have been when it came to the next match. Down. And why? Because Oscar and Rhea Ripley were having a really good rematch from WrestleMania that maybe was even better than the clash they had on Sunday. I was having a rollicking good time and I thought, oh man, if Rhea Ripley gets another win over Oscar, what a superstar we will have made. But we can't have nice things. WWE just takes them and flushes them down the toilet. Because after 10 minutes, Charlotte just decided she would interfere and that caused the disqualification. And all of this is just so uncreative. And I get that Flair is always going to be in a good position. Of course she is. She's really talented. But couldn't we have done something here where she has to work her way out from the bottom? Instead, she's just interfered in this. And then at WrestleMania Backlash, as we're calling it, it's so obvious it's going to be Oscar versus Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte just because she interjected herself into somebody else's match. Like if the WWE was real, that would probably get her suspended. Also, that is a disqualification, so bring down the DQ board that we started at the start of the year to document every single DQ in WWE. It goes up to 19. The Miz and John Morrison were then happy backstage because who the flub cares that they lost at WrestleMania and they bumped into Maurice. And John Morrison was all like, why are you here, Maurice? Even though she's the Miz's wife. But as it did turn out, she is going to be the guest on Miz TV. And John Morrison was a little upset about this because nobody had told him. So now I'm going to do this for at least the next few weeks. Please, please, WWE, you break up every other flipping team. Break these two up and let John Morrison have more singles matches. We then cut to Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler watching Mandy Rose slip at WrestleMania. And everybody just needs to prepare yourself for what was about to happen. Because they were laughing because ha ha isn't this hilarious even though the ramp was wet and it makes perfect sense before Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke arrived and then Dana Brooke and Shayna Baszler just left so that Nia Jax and Mandy Rose could have a conversation. Mandy made it clear that she doesn't care that she slipped and these things happen and she can laugh at herself and then looked at Nia and went and sometimes you never see things coming and she slapped her before Dana Brooke reappeared and they like rammed her into a wall. I was like, where the hell did Shayna Baszler go? And also, why does WWE have to take these things and turn them into stupid comedy? Anyway, this goes absolutely crazy later, so we'll come back to it. But what followed this was Alexa Bliss and Alexa Bliss's playground. And I would love to tell you what happened, but I don't think I know. Because she did say a lot of stuff, but all of it was one big 
riddle. She was like, oh, once there was this young girl who was lost and she didn't know what to do, but then the darkness found her. The darkness comforted her and the darkness gave her a path. But then the darkness went away and the little girl realized maybe I didn't need the darkness to begin with and maybe I'm more powerful than the darkness because ever since the darkness went away, I've become the darkness. Hey, who's the darkness? And these are real things, real words coming out of somebody's mouth. And I think she was saying that she is now more powerful than Bray Wyatt and she learned this because he got burned to a crisp. I don't know, I don't have any kind of a clue. She also has a new puppet friend called Lily and I just have a few questions. One, how the hell did this happen? Two, why did she bring Bray Wyatt back if she thinks more powerful than him? What a waste of your life, what a waste of your time. And three, why at the end of this did the puppet look at me and go, that is exactly what went down. I mean, you tell me. So this was just very strange and Alexa Bliss is very good at it but I still haven't been told why she did sit on a box-like structure at WrestleMania and have goo pouring down her face. And these are the kind of things I would like to know. We then went straight into Miz TV. And I never like it when WWE has these segments back to back because I just think it muddies the waters. But if only I had known what was just around the corner. Down. But yes, Maurice was on Miz TV because it's a brand new series of Miz and Mrs. So they were promoting that. And after John Morrison said, hey, why don't we do a spinoff called Mmm? Because it would be Morrison, Maurice and Miz. And they said, no, he looked quite upset. So let's go back to hoping. Now, if it is going to happen, I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. Because straight after this, the Miz and John Morrison were all like, oh man, Bad Bunny. He had such a good performance at WrestleMania. But without us, he would have been nothing. So we're going to take all the praise. This, of course, brought out Damian Priest, who was all like, you two are a bunch of goofs. You don't understand it. And then everybody wanted to have a singles match before Maurice said, I've got an idea. Because if you don't know, I'm in charge of Raw now. Why don't we do a handicap match? The Miz and John Morrison take it on Damian Priest. And I was like, that's fine. That's great. The Miz and John Morrison always lose. And what a great victory it will be for Damian Priest, who right now, coming off WrestleMania with momentum, probably needs a good win. I mean, why did I even hope? What an absolute bald buffoon I am. Because even though The Miz and Morrison weren't even in their ring gear, it finished after Maurice got on the apron and Damian Priest being a wrestler was just completely distracted. So the Miz snuck up behind him, hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, put his feet on the rope, and that's right, pinned him for the one, two, three. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And I get it, the Miz cheated. But do you remember when Drew McIntyre took on the Miz and Morrison? He absolutely ruined them. And I'm not saying that Damian Priest should be put into the same stratosphere as Drew McIntyre, but that should be the idea, given that he's really good. And you know, given that you just gave him all this star power by teaming him up with a proper celebrity. So we just took all of that and we hit reset. And also that is a distraction. Bring down the board, quite incredibly, it goes up to 45. Everybody also fell over Miz's pants afterwards because his pants had been ripped during the match. And there's a sentence that nobody on this earth has ever had to say. We had an interview with Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax after this and we saw Nia Jax being beaten up earlier and Nia made a great point. She went, why are we showing that? It literally happened 20 minutes ago. And given that Sheamus, Omos and AJ Styles went on this thing, I was like, yep, that's a good point. All of this had somehow put Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke in a position where they were gonna have a non-title tag team match though. And I genuinely, from the bottom of my feet, from my tootsie toes, I can't believe what am I about to tell you? Because of course, during her entrance, Nia Jax tripped up. That happened at WrestleMania, so it has to happen here. But later on in the match, when she was trying to get back in the ring, she slipped again, she fell on the mat, and when she got back in the squared circle, she was so mad, and I kid you not, this is real, in case you haven't seen Monday Night Raw, Dana Brooke and Mandy Rose ran away while they said to each other, it's not worth it, it's not worth it, and they intentionally got themselves counted out. It then got even worse because Byron Saxton was going, well, that's a much better thing to do to get counted out rather than get a victory over the tag team champions. And then Mandy Rose and Dana Brooks' music started to play like they'd done something that was good. Are you kidding me? You're a couple of cowards. Somebody slipped and you were so fearful about what they were going to do in a fight you legged it. Why are you even here? Why are you even professional wrestlers in the world of suspending my disbelief? This was unbelievable. I always like to look for the positives, but you could tell this to a child and flipping hell, you make up stories for children like, oh, there was a giant egg. And the guy's like, oh, I can't believe it. There was an egg. And even the kid would go, what? 
That doesn't make any sense. It made absolutely no sense, and I can't believe it was even an idea on a piece of paper, let alone something that happened in front of my eyes. It doesn't just get a down, it gets a brown down. MVP was then out to celebrate Bobby Lashley's success. I like MVP. He's been a revelation, as we know. He can have enough. He talked about how Lashley wasn't here because he feels disrespected by everything that happened at the start of the show, but he's the best. He's all the mighty. He's going to be the WWE champion till the end of time. And I was like, yeah, you tell me, MVP. I'm with you. You knew somebody was going to interrupt because, of course, it is Raw. And unsurprisingly, it was Drew McIntyre who was very, very upset by his WrestleMania loss. Essentially, it came down to the Hurt Lock versus the Claymore kick, and it didn't go the way he was expecting. But what he wants to happen now is is for Bobby Lashley's ego to get so big that when Drew McIntyre does win back his WWE title, it feels all the more sweet. And then we heard this. Rawr! Because out came Braun Strowman, who tried to make the argument, I beat Shane McMahon over WrestleMania, so I deserve a title shot. And I was like, oh yeah, man, beating Shane McMahon, that certainly deserves it. Randy Orton then arrived because he also thinks he deserves it after he beat The Fiend. And then of course, Adam Pearce walked out and said, well, you all make great points. They didn't, they didn't make great points at all. So what we will do is later on, we will have a triple threat match with the winner being the number one contender to Bobby Lashley. WrestleMania backlash. Ended with McIntyre and Strowman arguing backstage. And at one point, I would just like WWE to stop doing the whole, I want a title match, so I'm gonna walk to the ring and just make my case. Come up with a story, do anything. We then had two tag teams arguing with each other that they had lost over WrestleMania weekend because they couldn't take out one big dude but because the New Day really make me laugh, is getting it up. Because the short version is Elias and Jackson Riker out here ready to play a I'm Sorry song to Shane McMahon where they were interrupted by Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston. And like I say, these guys just have so many good references and they're so over the top and going back to what we were talking about earlier, not scripted at all, I laugh out loud and I feel entertained. But they were all like, ha ha, you got your ass whipped by Braun Strowman. So Elias and Jackson Riker, who's on leave right now from the Enterprise, were like, ha ha, you lost to Omos. So they had a match and the New Day won and that made me pleased. I don't know why we did this. I have no idea, but it was okay. Randy Orton was then cutting a promo saying that he was gonna win the main event. And I was like, yeah, you would think that. Why would you have a different opinion? It was then the first Firefly Funhouse in months. And once again, I don't really understand what the point of this was. Answers on a postcard and send them to me. But happy Bray Wyatt in his red jumper was back without one scar on him, because of course he went through the regeneration tunnel. And he essentially just talked to all of his puppets and said that everything's going to be okay. And here's where I have come to with this. You can now get in a time machine and go back two years to when we had the first Firefly Fun House. And I don't really think we've evolved this or progressed it at all. And it's not Bray Wyatt's fault. It's not Bray Wyatt's fault at all. He's a creative genius in certain ways, but he's just been so held back, especially given what happened at WrestleMania. I got nothing from this. It made me feel empty and that should never be the case. No one's got to get it down. The triple threat main event followed though. This was good stuff. Up. Drew and Randy teamed up to begin with because of course Braun Strowman is a human train and that's really hard to stop. But because he is so big, he was able to beat them up for a while. Decided to go outside to do his raw, I'm a train thing when he runs around the ring. <laughs> but Drew McIntyre had a great way to stop that and he just chucked the steps right into his face. Orton felt left out so he backdropped Drew McIntyre onto the announce table and this is basically how it went for a while. McIntyre and Orton would have a fight. Braun Strowman would like this so he'd beat them up. I mean, it was no Edge versus Roman Reigns versus Daniel Bryan, but it was fine enough. The finish was really great though, because Orton eventually hit Strowman with the RKO, and just as he was about to get the three, McIntyre flew in there, Claymore kicked Randy Orton right in the face, and pinned Orton to steal the win. So while it's a little bit like, oh, we're just going back to the same match for WrestleMania Backlash, that is one hell of a way to end a fight. And that's really where Raw should have ended. Like MVP walked down to the rampway and that was fine too. And he was staring down with Drew McIntyre. But then if you can believe it, Mace and T-Bar or Slapjack or whatever the hell they're called, two of them, I don't know, they still had their masks on, from Retribution appeared in the ring and they gave Drew McIntyre a double choke slam as they looked at MVP like, you're our father now. And I actually went, oh no, and here's why. I mean, for starters, Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin could have filled this role. But from a story perspective, that actually makes more sense. Because if once again we get in our time machine and we go back a few months, when Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander were the tag team champions, 
They beat up and beat Retribution every single week. So you telling me MVP went, oh no, Shelton and Cedric, they're not doing it for us. Let's go and get the losers and see if they're any better. I'm sorry, that's just bad storytelling. I like to be that guy. I'm a positive Pete and I love wrestling, but you can't justify that. It's super duper dumb, especially when you already had a faction that everybody loved. So it's getting it down. Also, when it comes to retribution, we got no payoff with that either. Mustafa Ali and these guys just looked at each other in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. It's like taking a chess piece and moving it around the board, but actually not doing anything. So I'm going to assume the reason this Raw felt like such a letdown was because we always raise our expectations for the Raw after WrestleMania and it did not deliver. So overall, it's gotta get it down. Now don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to rockculture.com where you can read yourself some articles. Make sure you follow What Culture on social media. And there's videos, I think they're over there. Sometimes I get confused, but they're around my head. Give them a click and watch some of them. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for watching me through this WrestleMania week. That's right, tomorrow we do get a break from ups and downs. Then, of course, I'll be back on Thursday because this train, kind of understanding Braun Strowman, never ever stops.